quite a few years ago, I remember um, while I was working in a few schools in our city, in the south of Moldova, in Kahul, I was invited, actually I was sent to uh, one of those uh, schools. At that time I used to teach about addictions. It was a project which we developed as a church there and uh, been uh, accepted by the, the local authorities. And um, <clears throat> I've been in quite many schools around, but at that particular school, the people from that school, they didn't know me. Uh, never met them, and uh, <clears throat> I went there, looked like uh, one of other uh, college students there, and <laughs> they, they couldn't uh, figure out who, who am I. And uh, <clears throat> I was waiting to, to meet, actually, someone to, to come and invite me to a class, and a lady came, and she started to talk with me, and uh, she said, we, actually, we wait someone, a guy who would present something about, uh, I don't know, and she started to speak in a way that <laughs> it, it became interesting for me, for me to hear from herself what expectations she would have about me. And <laughs> I, uh, I decided eventually to interrupt her and say that I am that guy, <laughs> uh, not letting her to go too far with her description and her um, um, waiting list. So she, she had a, a lot of expectations from, from me. But that moment when I said, I am that person, she looked at me with, and uh, so opened her eyes, so big eyes, and said, oops, <laughs> it's quite, uh, did I uh, say something wrong about you? Or, um, <clears throat> when we say, um, I am, on, on, when you are in such a situation like this, just imagine that situation. You may have been there. You may have been there. How, and, uh, how, how was your feelings? What, what was your reaction? Remember Jesus, he was in a familiar situation like this in his uh, earthly time when he came. He came and spoke to people and he used a lot of examples. And at one time he used this expression, I am. <laughs> I am the light. So you, you are looking for someone to come, a Messiah. A light, a savior, I am. But people have, they had different reactions. We are on uh, this um, time studying um, um, I am's of Jesus. Actually, Jesus said in Gospel of John, uh, it, it, it is recorded in Gospel of John, seven I am's. And we are here with, um, today with I am the gate, and I am the shepherd. And I would like to invite you to open your Bibles, the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Chapter 10. Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter this sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief, and the robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come, they will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not a shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. 
The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I just, just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. Amen. In theology, and uh, please don't be scared about this word, theology. I think it was, been, it was mentioned here. A theology is nothing else, not, nothing than to study God, <laughs> to study about him. Theology, is th it is a, a word com which comes from Greek, made by two other words, theos, which is God, and logia, which is knowledge or studying about God. So, studying God. In theology, there is a great tension, actually, uh, and of, um, that tension is made by two concepts. So, it, it is said that when people come to God and they want to know Him, there are mainly two concepts which are in a great tension. And they named, theologians, they, they, they named these concepts. Uh, one was named as theology from above, and the other one is theology from below. And this is actually, in many places, in many uh, times, they, they can't balance, they, they can't keep the balance. People, they can't keep the balance, and it, it becomes like a tension. But what means a theology from above? In itself, words explains to us that theology from above means to study God, but coming to Him to know Him with what He revealed to us from above, which what came from there? God sent His Son, and the Gospel of John said His Son was the Word. And the Word of God actually spoke in the past and presented Jesus Christ, His Son, as the Word of God. So theology from above will uh, emphasize this side, what comes from Him. But what is theology from below? <laughs> so theology from below means how we experience God. How, how did you experience God in your life? What's your experiences with God? So many people would say, let me show or let me tell you how it is in my life, how it is my life with God. And uh, using experiences as to describe Him, how they felt, which both of them, actually, they are good for our, uh, real, uh, for our uh, life and faith in Jesus. But they, both of them, must be kept in a balance. And uh, if we keep them in a balance, we have to have a question. And the right question for that is, which one comes first? <laughs> so many people, many uh, teachers of the Bible, they would come and they would stress this side from below, coming with the needs. So let's approach people with their needs and then from their needs to present God. This happened in Jesus' life as well. Do you remember the, the multiplying the bread? And when people, they came and they were seeking God, they were seeking uh, Jesus because of their need, their experience with Jesus. And they tried to know Him through their experience, through their need. But that wasn't the right way to approach Him. The right way to approach Him, it is to come and to understand how he is, and how He revealed Himself to us. That's the first thing we have to know. And the next one, our needs, will come after that. So this is the balance we have to keep um, in, uh, when we think about God. When we think about God, we have to understand who He is. And actually, the Gospel of John is written with this purpose. Uh, three other Gospels, they, they, they were written to present Jesus' life, but 
later, John comes with another gospel. And I mentioned quite a few times here that he came not because there was a need to be added something to the life of Jesus, although he came with other, um, other um, uh, um, talks and other events from Jesus' life, he came not to uh, make the picture a bit uh, larger about who uh, Jesus is and what he did. He came actually with a specific purpose, and the, the purpose of Gospel of John we find at the end. And that purpose is not to know him or to know something more about him, but to know him personally, to believe in him. There are a lot of things what happened, and if we would, would, would start to, to write down all, everything what Jesus did, there would, will not be paper, enough paper in this world to, to write down everything what he did. But what he chose to present here was for us to believe in him. To know him in such a way that we, as human beings, we, as, uh, as of mankind, to come and, and say, this is God himself who came in our world. And we have to come with a reaction. And that reaction has to be our faith. He is God himself who came to our world. And... Um, <clears throat> Um, stressing this idea, we went through the first chapters and then we decided it would be great to see what Jesus said about himself. And I am uh, those great affirmations or those great claims he did in the Gospel of John. So he said, I am the bread of life. That means I am the only satisfaction for you. When you look for bread and when you look for me because I can give you bread, remember, it is not the bread you need. <laughs> it is not just the only bread you need. It is the need, the greatest need, is to have me, said Jesus. And then he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows him will not walk in darkness and we need this light. Today I am shepherd and I am the gate. The reason I took both of them because they come in the same passage and they're describing the same actually example. They come from the same example with a, with a shepherd with a sheep and a sheepfold. Um, <clears throat> when we read uh, chapter 10 and actually what happens sometimes when we read the Bible is uh, we, we, we fell in that trap to, to read portion of the Bibles. It is good that we have chapters to find easy a, a passage in the Bible. It's like an address. When you say, uh, it's like a postcode, <laughs> if you want. When you need to go directly in a passage, it's easy to find it by chapters and by verses. But sometimes... Looking or thinking in this way by chapters and by verses, sometimes we lose the whole picture. And this, this might be a great, actually, danger for people. Because they try, and you know, we, we, uh, we, have, um, we have this um, uh, discipline sometimes to, to uh, uh, memorize verses, Bible verses, which is quite good. But this memorizing and sectioning the, the, the Bible and keeping the Bible, uh, the, the passages, the verses out of their context sometimes can lead us in, in, a, in a deception because we don't read the whole context. So for that, many, many false teachers would use Bible passages, just only verses, picking from here, from there, and making a quite strange theology and teachings about God, presenting himself eventually in a very uh, uh, different way that the Bible presents itself. So uh, when we read the Bible, we have to read it whole and to have this holistic idea of what happens. This, is happen this happens with uh, chapter 10. So the, the most interesting and the most important thing about chapter 10 is to know that chapter 10 comes after chapter 9. <laughs> In chapter 9, what is chapter 9? 
What, what happened there? In chapter 9, last time I mentioned and I, I, um, I told you about that blind man who was healed. Jesus gave him sight. And do you remember how happy was this man? How amazed were the people around? Not so happy his parents. <laughs> Very interesting. And most unhappy people there were Pharisees. And the chapter 9, chapter 9 actually ends with this um, dispute Jesus had with these people. If you uh, look on the last verses, Jesus had uh, quite a discussion with them. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. Those people, Pharisees, after interrogated him, they throw him out. Casting him out from synagogue meant to, to uh, isolate him from social uh, perspective. And uh, that, that was a, 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 even worse for a man in that times to be casted out from synagogue than to be blind. So they casted him out, and um, uh, when Jesus met him again, uh, he revealed himself to, to him. Um, and then he said, Lord, I believe in you. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. And on that discussion, on that um, dialogue, were present some people. Verse 40, some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? <laughs> they got the idea. Whom about Jesus was speaking there? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And that's the end of the chapter 9. Chapter 10. I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, he climbs but climbs in by some other ways. He's a thief and a robber. And he says that to Pharisees. He continues, he continues the, the discussion there with them. The Pharisees and um, the leaders of those times, they've been people who are assigned or been there to lead the spiritual, the spiritual way uh, Israel. They came to the, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all teachers of the law for knowledge, and not just knowledge, but they came, people all around came and looked to them for guidance. But Jesus told them that they are blind. And you may recall that passage when Jesus said, how a blind can lead another blind man. If a blind man can or try to lead someone who is blind, eventually they will fail. It's not possible. So he addressed this to the Pharisees. Now, he is uh, coming with a quite interesting symbolistic Im imagery about sheep and shepherds. Um, sh a shepherd, the idea of shepherd and sheep was quite common for those days in uh, Israel. And we can find actually um, this picture of a shepherd from even from beginning. And we will find it quite till the end of the Bible. Do you remember Abraham? Isaac, Jacob, all of them, they've been, they've been shepherds. They had a lot of sheep. That was their um, uh, occupation, or that, 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 the, the way they lived, they provided for them. And then you may remember, you may recall about Moses. Forty years he was in 
Egypt, studying, <laughs> being raised under Pharaoh's um, um, imperium, but the next 40 years he spent with sheep. And he was a shepherd. Later on in the uh, nation history, we find the greatest king of Israel. The greatest king who was um, like a pattern. So all other kings being measured by his standards. And that king was David. But you may remember about David. <laughs> How he was elected, chosen. How he was chosen as a king. He was with his sheep and I think Eli, no, Samuel, sent some, from his, some, some people from his family and they, they brought David from his sheep there. And he became uh, eventually a great king. The Psalm 23, the greatest psalm we love. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Even God himself takes this um, image, the word uh, image, as, uh, to apply for himself. He is the great shepherd, God himself. Ezekiel 34, it's God there who presents himself as the great shepherd. All those leaders of the nations, they failed to be the shepherds, the good shepherds for the nation. They led astray the nation. But God himself said, I am the good shepherd. And from that point, he reflects himself up to the New Testament times. And in, uh, in uh, chapter 34, Ezekiel, he, there is a prophecy prophesying about what will happen and who will come. And I think in, in um, 34, um, I can't find exactly the, 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 the passage down till 20, I think. Ezekiel 34:20. It says that someone will come. David will come. <laughs> David will come and he will establish the kingdom again. But the, you know, this idea of coming again, of da David coming again in times of Ezekiel, you know when Ezekiel wrote this, the, his book, it was later, much later than David living. He was dead. How David would come again? There he speaks in a, uh, in a messianic way. He speaks in the future. And who came from David's um, lineage? It was Jesus. And Jesus came to fulfill that prophecy. He is the great shepherd. Remember what First Peter, in, uh, uh, Peter, he says in his epistle, he is the great shepherd, the shepherd of our souls. That's a great picture. The shepherd, the shepherd of our souls. He's the great shepherd. But how we know him? How we recognize him? Actually, do you know him? Um, <clears throat> we used to, to ask many times, well, do you know God? Do you know Jesus? And they may say, when, when I was... Uh, um, I, I did evangelism on this. I, I tried to present uh, many, you know, tracts and to start to speak to people. And they said, oh, I know a lot about God. I know a lot about Jesus. But then the question we address to them and we used to address them is, do you know him personally? And many, many people would say, yes. And even now, even, even us, even now, 
here we can say, yes, I know Jesus. But let me address another question, which, which would be quite a challenge. So do you know him? And you may say yes. And then the next question. How do you know that you know him? <laughs> Have you talked about that? How do you know that you know him? Here, chapter 10. Jesus, the shepherd. Let's get into the passage and find out how do we know? How do we know that we know him? He is the shepherd, and um, the, the picture here is, one, is, is a great one. You, you may know a lot of things about that, um, um, <clears throat> even though I think England, it was always mostly industrial. <laughs> and uh, um, you may, but you, you may came across with uh, uh, farms and uh, the idea of shepherds and um, how sheep are to, uh, to take care of them. And um, <clears throat> I, for a while, I wasn't so bold in sharing this. And actually, I, I, I tried to hide. <laughs> But now I can say it very open that I used to be a shepherd. I come from Moldova, where the south of Moldova, it was um, actually Moldova was for a long time, until um, nowadays, it was agrarian mostly. And since I remember myself, um, I was sent, uh, my father sent me on uh, summertime with uh, lambs. We had, we used to have sheep. And um, you know that very no well-known village in the south, Brunza, which <laughs> it was mentioned quite a few times. Brunza means the cheese. There is a story behind that, <laughs> how this locality, how this village uh, uh, became to be uh, the cheese, how it was known as the cheese. So the legend says, or you know, people they say, from a long, long time ago, there was a lot of shepherds that was a region, a pasture, the great fields where people came with their, um, with, with their sheep. And there was a place where they did the cheese. And that was the place, our village. Later on became our village. Uh, <clears throat> that cheese. And it seems this tradition was kept by people in this village <laughs> to, keep che to keep sheep. And my father, he liked to have sheep, so we, we always had until a few years ago when they, they said it's enough, no more help from my children, so <laughs> now it's the time to, um, to stop here. But on my time, when I was a, a teenager, I remember myself how I was sent every summer. And the picture you see in, in some you know, picture Bibles and uh, those... Uh, um, painters with a good shepherd, with a very nice uh, uh, place there, with a very, very um, calm the, um, lamb in his uh, arms. Uh, that, that wasn't <laughs> in, my, in my experience. So I had about 15, 20 sometimes lambs, and the lambs, you had to have good uh, fit to run and to, to chase them and to sometimes I came home I was so sad <laughs> I was so angry and saying no more I'm not tomorrow I'm not going <laughs> anymore with them it was so hard and never never uh, went to the the level to uh, to lead the sheep so what was my experience it was to drive them as much possible so I trained even a dog to help me and you'll see many pictures, and actually the Western, some commentators would say that the Western side used to, to uh, care sheep with this way, to drive them, using dogs. But wasn't the case with Israel and that Eastern side of the world. The shepherd there used to lead the sheep. And here we find the great picture. How is this shepherd described. He is the one who enters by the gate 
And he is the one who knows his sheep by name and leads them out. He, not, he, he, he does not drive them. He leads them. There was enough trust from those animals to this shepherd, to this man, that they followed him. When, um, when we see this picture, we are to understand, actually, what is the real picture of a leader. He is the one who leads by his example. And many times in the Bible, shepherd, the idea of shepherd, we find it actually in, two, in these two dimensions. One is this human dimension about leaders who are appointed to lead a church, the flock. The church is mentioned as the flock. But sometimes the, the shepherd is represented as God himself. He is the great shepherd. We are under shepherds. And we are called to take care of his flock. The church is not our church. It's not my church. It is his church. Many times we, we tend to use this term, whose church is that? Uh, this church is, belongs to, to that pastor or to that leader. If someone, if there is a great leader and he is a very um, known and uh, he's, uh, very, he, he imposes himself in, in his personality over the church, people would tend to say this is his church, but it's not true. The church does not belong to any human leader. The church belongs to God. We have to avoid this as much possible because we are here to take care of his flock. And um, that's a great picture, actually, because he is the leader. And whoever enters through him will be saved. The picture there was... Um, the sheep fold, and um, some commentators would say the picture here is taken by the sheep fold they had in the village. So from verse 10 till verse 6, uh, uh, from verse 1 till six, uh, verse 6, he is presenting the, the, the sheep fold which was in the village. A sheep fold in the village was actually a place where the sheep were kept by night, during the night, and in that sheepfold, a few shepherds came with their sheep, and they hold together their sheep. Their sheep. And in the morning, the shepherd came, and he went there, and imagine there was quite few flocks together. It was one there, but they had to pick each one of them. How he did that? He just named them. He called by name. <laughs> and they recognized his voice and they went out after him. That's a great picture. Never happened with me. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I was thinking, when I, I raise my voice, they start to run. <laughs> I wasn't a great picture. <laughs> a great example. But this shepherd, he, with his voice, could call them out, and they went out. Also, when he took them in, there was a very interesting um, experience there. What, what he did, it was he had his stuff or road, and he put on the, on the um, gate, and he stopped each of his sheep. And he examined her, examined them to see if there is anything with them. Maybe they had some uh, owns or some problems. And he had to, to, to examine them and to take care of them. Each one of them passed through his hands. 
and then went in. When he took them out, he called them, and they went out and led, led them to the great uh, pasture there, and they they been fed. When um, when he describes Jesus, he is using the gate picture from uh, um, verse 10. I am the gate. He says, actually, the commentators would say, would say that this picture is taken by another sheepfold which they used in the field. That was a different one. In the fields, sometimes they, they kept their flocks over there, far away from the village, and in, in the fields, during the night, they've been danger. They've been attacked in many times. So they had to, to make a sheepfold, a pen, and then at the gate, the shepherd itself stood there, laid down. And during the night, if someone wanted to come and steal or to attack the flock, they had to cross the gate. But at the gate there was shepherd. He laid down. And they had, even though it was wolf, wolves, they had to go over him. So he had to fight with them. Shepherds were good fighters. You remember David. <laughs> he had the ability to fight with lions, with bears, with wolves, all kinds of animals, wild animals. So there was a great danger for them. They could even die for their flock. I think from this picture comes that uh, saying which we use sometimes, over my dead body. <laughs> so you do that over my dead body. That means I will do as much I live, as much I'm in alive. You'll not do that because I'm there. I will oppose with all my strength, with all my life to this action. So the shepherd was there. And he said, I will give my life if that's necessary. But here comes the great picture about this shepherd. Jesus said, I will lay, my, I will lay down my, my life for my sheep. But if we think with this, with our understanding, human understanding, we'd say, for what is worth a shepherd to give him his life, what will happen with this flock after? If the shepherd dies, what will happen with him? What will happen with the, the flock? And here comes the great picture of the shepherd. He has authority not to give his life just, but also he has authority to, to take it back. And that's the great picture of Jesus. He has this authority to give himself, to lay down his life, but also he has the authority to take it back. And in this way, he overcome, overcame the final battle over death. He is the great Savior. <laughs> he died for us, but he rose again. And that's the great picture. Now, I described a bit this shepherd, this idea or this model of a great shepherd the question is now about us. How do we recognize him? So first, let's see about uh, sheep. Some would say that the sheepfold is the church. So some um, uh, scholars, they would say, or look there and say, ah, the, the sheepfold, we know, the shepherd is Jesus, but the sheepfold is the church. But I think this idea... This understanding of the sheepfold, the term of sheepfold, is not quite in the passage because uh, will not have any sense if we say Jesus has, he takes them out and then he brings them in. So it never happens with this idea with uh, Jesus to bring people in the church and then to take them out. So I think the sheepfold there has another meaning. 
especially we understand it when we read uh, down of uh, his saying that he has some other sheep from another sheepfold. So he has to bring other sheep in his flock, which are not from this sheepfold. And I think he, here he speaks about um, us as Gentiles, those who are not part of Israel. The sheepfold actually is Judaism. Judaism was described, and the law they had, even um, in uh, some, some writers and some um, uh, uh, p- commentators, they see and they, they study and they see that law was described as the fence. Law was the protection for them for a while to protect them from other influences around in that times. But Jesus comes now and he opens the door, he is the gate, and he brings other sheep from another fold, sheepfold. And that's the Judaism. And he will make one flock. <laughs> some um, some uh, sheep from other parts, they come now together. And we are those sheep. How to know that we are part of his flock? There are quite a few simple um, this things here described in, uh, in the passage. The most important one is that we know him. How do we know him? How do the sheep know the shepherd? We know his voice. That's the most important thing. We know his voice. I think when Jesus said that, it is clear that he didn't mean that we know his sound of his voice. Our ear is capable to understand, to make a difference between sounds. This is how we have our voice pattern, which is known. And you may know sometimes um, on uh, some, um, uh, I, I, I came across with this, you have to register somewhere and you register your voice. That's a, a, like a, a security password to go into a system. Your voice can't be faked because it's unique. His voice there is unique, but it's not about his sounds. He's not uh, telling them, they're about this pattern of sound. His voice actually is, or means, his teachings. Who knows him? Who knows his teachings? That one knows him. You can't follow a stranger. You can't follow uh, um, someone which has a different voice or teaching. If you follow anyone else with a different voice, actually you are in the most danger, dangerous place to be killed. Let's expand a bit the, this uh, example or picture of a ship fold, shepherd, the animal which were attacking the most, the sheep was wolves. Where do we find wolves in the New Testament? Can you quote a passage for me? Wolves, all kinds of animals in the Bible. But in the New Testament, when the animal comes, they come as a, to represent something. It's a symbol of something. Wolves coming in um, Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, uh, I think that's about um, those who are evildoers or do prophecy or do miracles in his names, but they don't know Jesus. Also, there is written there in Matthew 7, 15, watch out of false prophets they come to you in sheep's clothing 
but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. So the wolves here are described as false prophets or false teachers who come and they want to attack the flock. The most danger attack comes now through teachings. Through teachings. The church today is mostly attacked through teachings. We may pray and we pray and we are sensitive with those brothers which are in those countries where uh, the, the church is very persecuted and we are to do that, to help them. But I think we lost the sense of danger here because we think the church is mostly attacked when the authorities and the others from outside, they attack. They are forbid us to, to, to meet, to worship him when actually the most dangerous attack comes from inside, through oaths, through teachings. And I've seen this in our country. As long as our country has been persecuted by communists, the churches, they grew. I don't know how it was there. There, was a real simple, there wasn't a, a worship team to lead the church. and There was a simple man there standing with a book and singing one, only one Bible in our village. When I was, uh, my, my grandmother said, she, she said, when she was a, a, a young uh, a teenager in the, the church, there was just only one Bible. And they kept it secret. They couldn't meet in anywhere in the village in a public way. They could meet just in the houses or somewhere in the fields on the darkness. Why? And the church grew. Grew. That wasn't the most dangerous times for them. Today is the most dangerous time when people come into the church and they try to deceive, to lead astray. Do we know him? How do you know that you know him? Knowing his teachings, knowing his voice, his word. It's, it's, quite, it's quite simple and at the same time complicated. <laughs> How do we know? You may find different times people who would say, I'm sincere with God, I'm praying, and you'll, you, you will find people which are sincere with God, but this sincerity is not enough. That you are sincere. This is enough. Is not enough to protect yourself in the church. You have to know him. You have to know what he thinks. You have to know his will. About seven or eight years ago, in our church was a, a young man. He was so devoted. He read his Bible. And, but at one point, I felt his kind behaving weird. He started to isolate from the others. And I started to, to ask him questions. What, what happened with you? What, what, what's going on? Why are you so reserved? And, and, and even he said, <clears throat> it's not worth to go anymore to, to school. You know, I will be in the Lord's service. And it, it, at one side, it was real. Uh, you could see his real zeal and passion for, for Christ. But on the other side, you could feel something is going wrong there. And then discussing more and more. And when uh, I went deep with, in the conversation with him and found that he was actually led by a new teaching which came in our area at that time that uh, someone can be perfect, can get the perfect level and he went in different passages, and, and that actually attitude and the, the feeling he had made himself to step back. Now, when I'm looking back and I'm analyzing his life, he went astray. But immediately when he said that, I took him through the Bible, through all other verses, and studied in the context what that verse means. But he couldn't receive it. He was so much captured by this old idea, old attack, that he couldn't go out from that, 
from that understanding. And many times, many other teachings which come, when you have his voice here, here, it's something which comes immediately. You may not come with an immediate answer, but you will you'll feel that something is not quite in line with what I know from the Bible. Because you are that one which you're used with his voice. How often are we exposed or train our voice, our hearing to his voice? This is the main thing which help us to understand. Another one, how do we know that we know him? The passage ends with this. It's like an, uh, an a peak. It's an, um, he is the shepherd, the good shepherd, because he lays down his life. He dies. He dies for us. I think death is the most deep experience which helps us to know him. For that, Paul, it takes it again and picks up again this topic in, uh, in, the, in the epistles and even in um, um, Philippians. I think he says, to know him and his death. I was crucified with him that now I'm not living for myself but I live for for him this experience of death his death which applies to our spiritual situation actually becomes the most intimate the most profound experience in the relationship with him when we put to death all our desires <laughs> Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing. Nothing but His will. Nothing. Nothing but Him in my life. When we are led by His example, by Him in this way, putting to death all our carnal desires, that puts is putting us to the right path, walking after the right shepherd. Whoever wants to follow me, do you remember what he has to do? To put, to take the cross. <laughs> Again, this image, take the cross with Jesus. I think we have to, to stop here. But the question I think we have to take with us. Do you know him? If you say yes, then we have the second question. How do you know that you know him? How do you know? Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you came in our world to lead us and to save us. Thank you that you, you, you gave your life for our sins. Thank you, Lord, that you came in this world to give your life. You abandoned your life for us to live and have this abundant life. <laughs> Thank you that you are the great shepherd. Thank you that we have an example. Help us as those who are in your ministry to lead in the right way the flock of God and protect us of any other danger which comes from outside or from inside. Help us to stay tuned with, his, with your voice, to stay close enough with you to understand and to know your voice, to know your will, 
and to do your will every day in our life. Help us and protect Shirley Community Church. Make us the most strongest church here <laughs> in your word. Make us strong in hearing and understanding your will. Amen.